Okay, thank you for uh, the questions that have come through. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to take them from the first one that came through to the last one. <laughs> um, okay, so this question reads, um, Kyle, I think this was linked to your first opening talk. In the six ways that the church can help, one of the ways is to listen and learn. Sometimes we ask people, how are you doing? But are we really wanting to know or just playing religion? I think they're asking. So the question is, how do we do this meaningfully and genuinely when we're asking people, how are they? Yeah, I think um, probably with, with that, it's sometimes worth asking a follow-up question, how are you really doing? I think for a lot of people that will signal that you are really asking because it's, it's in some ways you can understand it. Hey, I mean, you come to church on a Sunday and someone says, how are you doing? And you say, fine. And you're not trying to be deceitful. You're just, you know, you, you don't want to fall into a heap <laughs> while answering the question and trying to get to your seat. So I don't think it's that people are badly motivated, but they might feel like, I'm, you know, thanks for asking, but the service is about to begin and I need to go find a seat. And so I think if we're really going to ask that question and listen, we need to find the right moment to ask it. Um, we need to make sure we give them our full attention. Um, maybe if they tell us how they're really doing, we can respond by praying for them. Um, right, just sort of normal friendship stuff. So I think it's making the time for that and being intentional that if I really want to check in on this person and see how they're doing, have I made, have I thought about how to do that well and not just kind of quickly in 30 seconds tell me how you're doing. But it's if, if this is going to be a real conversation, I need to set aside the time for it. Great. Does anybody else want to add to that? Is that okay? Sorry, okay. I would just say, oh, oop, didn't stretch that far. Um, I would say how you respond when somebody asks you the question is a really important aspect of that. Um, obviously, in a lot of contexts, you don't go into detail. but. Take the word fine out of your vocabulary when somebody asks you that question. And come up with a very short but truthful statement. I, I think if we just say, well, you know, I'm good this week, but I've struggled with this. It's just, a, it's just a note. It's just a little grain of truthfulness in there that they might follow up with later and ask you. So it's, it's good to be, just be transparent yourself mm -hmm. and not just, oh, I'm great, fine, great, thanks. But just <coughs> one little short statement. Again, it's not a context that you need to go into detail. But just that little bit of, wow, you know, this week's been a challenge because of this, and then that's it. Pray about that for me. And then that's all you have to say. It doesn't have to be a, a big confessional thing um, right there in that context. But to just give an open door that I'm willing to discuss these things, you don't have to put on a face in front of me. Right. Thanks, Pamela. That's helpful. Okay. The next question reads, um, and I think any of you can answer, whoever wants to. Uh, which of the two people causes the barrier between the mentally healthy person and the mentally sick? So I think I think it was also in your opening talk, actually, Kyle, you mentioned something about that. So, yeah, do you understand the question? Yeah, between the two, who is it that's actually causing the barrier? The one who's mentally healthy or the one who's mentally sick? Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose if we're talking about specific relationships, there's always going to be uniquenesses in that. Uh, the point I was I was sort of trying to make is that I think sometimes in our culture we've got these big categories that separate <coughs> us and if, especially if we have these categories well this is a psychological thing and and uh, it's, I'm not an expert in, in psychology so I really shouldn't be getting involved in that in that sense there's a kind of you know, some beliefs in our culture that are playing a role in separating us from each other but of course we believe those things and, and exacerbate them by, by kind of going along with that. So I, I think that in that sense, we're, we're all involved in, um, in separating ourselves from one another, not listening to each other, not moving towards each other. So I think that's where we all have a role to play, wherever, kind of wherever we are, we're at. Of course, you always want to be making sure if you're sharing personal sensitive information that you're doing it with someone that's trustworthy. Um, but I think we can all probably play a role in moving towards others and being, being open, asking for help, 
uh, asking questions, asking each other how we're really doing. Um, yeah, so I suppose we can all contribute to the problem. We can also all contribute to the solution. Does anybody else want to add anything? I think um, I think the question was being asked more in like a relationship level, like um, if you know of someone who's struggling with mental with, with something that, like depression, anxiety, like in that person-to-person -person relationship, like would you know which which one of you is it that's making it more harder for the relationship to happen? I think I think that's kind of uh, more where the question is coming right. from. Right. Well, and maybe it's the same answer, but I just no, thought I'd well, reframe it. Yeah, I think. Of course, remember, if mental health is about your ability to cope, and so if someone's unwell, they're, they're not coping, which, is, which means that part of that is probably going to be expressed in that they're, not, they're struggling to do relationship, so they're not going to be, in that sense, a great friend. They could then feel ashamed. They could pull back. They could withdraw. Um, but it's not because they're a bad friend. It's because they're struggling. And then if there's kind of judgment and it's like, oh, this person is a terrible friend. Uh, so I think if we respond to, to weakness and to suffering with judgmentalism, then the problem can be on the side of the person who's, let's say, mentally well. Um, but that's not a godly response. Um, and so I think we'd want to make sure that we're moving towards people who are struggling and I think maybe just a practical thing for, for all of us is when someone pulls away from a relationship, not to assume the worst, but to think maybe they're struggling. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not responding to my WhatsApps, not because they're a bad person, mm -hmm. um, or not because they don't care about me, but it's maybe because they're struggling. And so let me just, I don't know, make it a bit of an extra effort and, and not jump to conclusions about that maybe a compassionate response is, is better. Thanks. Um, these next two questions concern trauma. So I guess we'll start with you, Pamela. Um, childhood trauma often gets diagnosed as ADHD in schools and medicated with contramol, is that right? Um, if the root cause is later identified as trauma, should the teen reassess meds or does the meds help regardless of the cause? Do you need me to ask that again or are you? Yeah, that can be a difficult thing because a lot of the trauma therapies don't really, they, they lose their effectiveness if the brain is on drugs. So sometimes if you have a good, um, I would say like a professional counselor who's doing therapy with the child, they will need to think about going off medication for a period of time, depending on the severity. It, it depends on the child. Um, for the most part, it can happen in a comfortable environment if they're getting just good talk therapy. Um, once it's identified that trauma is part of the problem, it's not all of the problem. Um, trauma can be the, the main crux of why they're facing what they're facing, but you still have to deal with what's going on. So knowing trauma's at the root of it doesn't necessarily change everything that's helpful about what's happening. You don't go back to square one. There's a lot of things that are identified as ADHD and then now with different diagnosis from DSM-5, some of that is no longer a diagnosis and things are shifting, what they call things. But keep in mind what Kyle shared earlier, any diagnosis is simply a description of a group of symptoms. It's not that you take a blood test and it says you have this. Or, you know, it's not this virus or this bacteria causing this. It, it's not a scientific absolute. It's a group of symptoms. And different, you might get a, a child might get a diagnosis of having ADHD from one school counselor or from one secular counselor or whatever. They've done some testing and they qualify under that particular test's qualifications. Someone else may say, no, they don't. So the label of ADHD is not always helpful. Knowing what it causes and the learning disabilities that can be attached to it is very helpful in an educational environment. But a child having the label is not. So does it mean that they come off medication? Probably not totally. 
But if some of that can be healed over time, then the medication might not be possible or you know, it might not be needed. Um, so there are ways to heal the heart, which then affects the behaviors. But it's not a quick process. If you're talking about a child, the brain was developing during that time. So certain things about the brain did not get wired right. And that's a long process of relearning that in the brain and reteaching the brain and developing new pathways. It's not a sudden thing, and the medication may need to be continued to help with that. But um, there is a lot of over-medication. So just be aware. If you have a child that's been diagnosed, be real discerning and get more than one opinion. and and look at the lowest possible dosages that um, seem to help them personally in their school environment or home environment. Thanks. Anybody want to add anything? No. Um, this is sort of a follow-up question to that, I, th I think. Um, are there biblical counselors in Cape Town who specialize in PTSD? Oh, sorry, it's not the same, <laughs> but it's linked to trauma. Yeah. Are there, are there biblical counselors in Cape Town that specialize in post-traumatic stress disorder? Um, PTSD, again, is a specific diagnosis, um, and it requires a certain level and severity of trauma to be classified as that. Um, I don't personally know a biblical counselor that is working specifically with PTSD. Um, a few of us are working with trauma, and which PTSD falls under that. But PTSD is a severity of an issue to where it's not just that it's disrupting your life and your life choices and your behaviors. It can be a very threatening situation. So I would suggest if you know someone who really has suffered severe PTSD, that they be working with a psychiatrist, a professional, alongside a biblical counselor. And that's what you will see in our model of our churches is that we don't expect to be able to handle everything as a biblical counselor. It's a teamwork project. It's something that we all invest in the lives of someone. So we might need to have a professional alongside. Um, and there's nothing wrong with incorporating that. We might need to um, redefine some things from a biblical perspective as they're getting certain therapies or treatments, as they're being told certain things from a secular counselor. We might need to be unpacking that a little bit for them as a Christian. But that's where our discernment and our experience comes in handy as a biblical counselor in knowing how to interact with that team that is necessary for their care. Thanks. Follow up on that. Uh, OK. Um, the next one's about fear. So maybe Colleen, you or Sam want to take this one. Um, so the question is, how do we reconcile fear with faith? Sure. It's quite broad, but it's yeah, how do you broad. reconcile fear with faith? Um, I think I prefer you to answer that if you don't mind. <laughs> I think it's helpful to remember that um, it's not sinful to be scared. <coughs> I mean, I know. It seems obvious to say, but it is helpful to remember that it's not sinful to be scared. In fact, the Bible assumes we will be scared, right? That's why it's, it's so often uh, God makes promises in the context of fear. So it's it's kind of we can get a little bit kind of confused by this because some of these promises or some of these um, uh, encouragements from God come in the form of commands, like "Do not be anxious," which is grammatically an imperative but a lot of imperatives actually function like promises so um i always th th i always think of one of my daughters um when she was really young and she got scared she'd say daddy i'm scary <laughs> <laughs> and then i'd say to her don't be scared and i'd pick her up and i'd scoop her and hug her and i'm not actually giving her a command even though grammatically it's in the form of a command what am, I, what am I saying? I'm actually making a promise to her and comforting her. And I'm saying, you don't need to be scared because I'm here and I've got you. So I think that we sometimes get confused with, it, with some of this language in Scripture. Of course we get scared. Now, there is a form of, of sinful anxiety, um, but um, that's, you know, because sometimes we're looking to something other than God for security or, or something like that. 
Um, so there is a form of anxiety that reveals a heart's loyalties that are divided. Even in that context, though, we turn, we turn to God. We're always turning to God, right? Whether we're turning to God in a place from, of trust or turning to God from a place of distrust and repentance, we're still turning back to God. So I think in that sense, um, it's possible to be trusting God while feeling scared. And so that, that's, I would say, is how they coexist. Um, and just because you're trusting God doesn't mean you stop being scared of something. This is actually where that book on Untangling Emotions is really helpful. Um, because sometimes we'd say to someone in a situation, if they're not scared, we'd actually be quite worried about them. <laughs> like some situations are dangerous. Mm -hmm. So in a fallen world, you need those negative emotions to stay safe, to look after yourself, to protect other people. Um, yeah, so. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> oh, yeah, sure. I'm just thinking similarly with somebody who's depressed. You know, so if, if their experience is that emotionally it feels like God is absent and he's not there, they can still, even in their turning to the Lord and saying, Lord, where are you? I feel like you have left me. It can feel like a faithless statement, but in some ways it's a faith-filled statement because they're still coming to the Lord saying, well, Lord, I expect you to be here. That's who I, th who I think you are. I expect you to be present, and I, I expect you to be a loving father, and so I'm confused. Mm -hmm. so, so it's like even in the questioning, there's actually there's a faith mixed up in there because we are still turning to God who feels absent. But actually even in the turning to him with our questions, there is faith in that. Yes. Yes. Um, okay. This question says, I work in a hospital, and I experience trauma daily. Uh, it's hard to find a quiet place. Sometimes I only experience the trauma days later, and it affects my emotions. Is there anything I can do to manage it while at work? Yeah, I think we need to look at the definition of trauma, because this is a mixture of things. They're in a hospital where physical trauma is going to definitely be present. Um, the physical side of the the staff and the doctors and the nurses are there to deal with physical trauma. What she's experiencing can be emotional trauma. So I want to divide those two. They are different. Um, when you're subjected sometimes to physical traumas, you, that can be something that your experience in your heart then is trauma. Um, but there are things, um, helpful exercises that you can do. Um, depending on what our context is, or their, I don't know, she, he, I don't know. Um, I don't know. Because of their context, the role that they have, they may or may not be able to take a moment away. But there are ways that you can compartmentalize. Um, and as counselors, we do that to some degree, if we're hearing a lot of trauma. Um, one of the ways that we protect our own selves from vicarious trauma is to learn to compartmentalize some. So. If you're hearing something or seeing something horrific, it's not that you're gonna ignore it. That's not healthy. You need to react to it, but you might need to imagine a box you're gonna put it in for now. And I know doctors that do this. If you're, if you're a trauma doctor in an ER, you can't take the time to grieve what you're seeing after each episode that you are exposed to. Um, doctors get really good at compartmentalizing things. They don't necessarily become unemotional in every area of their life, but they learn, I need to compartmentalize. So there's skills that you can learn. Um, if, you're, if you're here and still present in the room, come talk to me afterwards. There's, there's resources that can teach you skills of how to do that in a healthy way where you're not ignoring it and just becoming cold. You're not ignoring it and letting it build up so that it's harmful to you. You're compartmentalizing. You're saying, I will deal with that later. And you do. You go back to it and you, you unpack things in a healthy environment where you can feel safe. But that is really helpful if you're just constantly subjected to something like that. Um, just also two resources that might be helpful. Um, Eliza Huey's written a book, it's actually for kids, but it's, it could be great for adults, is on um, a breathing exercises. It's actually at the, at the book table, it's called, um, what is it called, Chris? In, yeah, count yourself calm. 
Uh, that's actually a great little book. It's kind of breathing exercises mixed mm -hmm. with kind of memorizing a verse. Um, and then she's actually got another book. It's more of a long-term thing on self-care. So I think if, especially if you're in a sort of quite an intense job, um, then that kind of thing could be good in terms of just li like, how's my lifestyle? Do I have things in my lifestyle that are rejuvenating and healing? Um, so those could be two books worth worth checking out. Yeah, resources are that plethora of things around breathing exercises, physical things that you can do that do require you to step away from the situation for a moment. Um, you can't, in the middle of an ER situation, stop and calm yourself and do breathing exercises. You're engaged. Um, so it's a matter of what your situation is. Um, but yeah, feel free to come to us afterwards for more specifics. Thank you. Okay, so those are the questions I got on the WhatsApp number. Does anybody want to ask a question from the floor? You're more than welcome. Anything? I was just wondering if you could speak to the differences of the depression and maybe anxiety in men and women. Hmm, that's an interesting thing. Um, so I'm thinking, are you, are you looking for stats? No, that sort of... And how it presents. Hmm, that's interesting. I'm not thinking that it, that it necessarily presents that much differently. Men often show a lot more anger and denial. Yeah, a woman can too. Uh, I'm not sure. Do you have any... I had read in some about it. No. Uh, it's, an in, it's a really interesting question. Um, is there a difference between men and women? Um, yeah, I don't have a... I think you could say there's a difference between someone who is more emotionally aware versus someone who is less emotionally aware. And I don't want to draw gender stereotypes there. Yeah. But I think that is what you might be seeing yeah. um, as you look in general um, between men and women. I mean, men and women are clearly different. Hey, I, th I think the the thing for counselling, though, is you're always paying attention to the person in front of you. Mm -hmm. And um, as you do that, you just realise, gosh, every individual is so unique that um, the sort of golden rule is, let me just listen carefully to the person in front of me and try and figure out where they're at. Anything else? Hi, um, my question is how do how can you go about um, helping a family member that has been diagnosed with um, depression, isn't taking any treatment, and is basically still in the same condition that has been affected by trauma, childhood trauma, so all the conditions have just piled up and piled up, and unfortunately... Um, they still don't want to take counsel, even though you can just see all the symptoms taking place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's 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 trauma coming through the years. The person's now finding themselves depressed. As a family, you can see what's, you can see this, you can see what's going on. You're seeing the impact on them, you're seeing the impact on the family, but the person themselves don't, doesn't want to acknowledge it and they don't want to deal with it. Am I right? That is so hard. That is just such a hard situation where we can't control somebody else. We can't, we can encourage them, we can make suggestions, but, but I, we can pray for them. But I, th I think we are limited by the person's willingness to engage. Mm. So I think we can perhaps ask God for wisdom, give, to give us wisdom as to are there ways that we can, we can help them think things through 
in little ways, help them come to a decision that this would be helpful for them? Are there things that, they, are there things that they're concerned about? Like, what, what are the things that are stopping them wanting to do something about it? Is there something they're afraid of? Is there stigmas involved? Is there, you know, I, I, so I guess the question, what stops you, would be a good question to ask. What are you afraid of? What are you concerned about? Um, what assumptions do you make about, do, what do you think will happen if, if you go to see a counsellor or a doctor or um, can they, so, so unpacking, what are, they, what are they thinking now, what are they thinking might happen? Um, perhaps it could also, you could also help point out to them the impact that it's having, perhaps on their own life on other people's lives, do they see that? Is, that, is that what they're wanting, would they like something different, what would they like their life to look like, so perhaps just help them think through some of those things. No, I agree. Um, one thing that I always question in a, in a family relationship is that very often, if one member of that family has experienced certain traumas, particularly in childhood, other family members were in the same situation. So if there's another family member that is willing to take a step out and ask for help and experience healing, that can be igniting to the person who is, at this point, totally refusing to get help. Because very often, it's a matter of fear of saying, if I revisit that, things are just going to get worse. I don't want to think about that. I've spent my life since then not thinking about that, and I don't want to go back. So if that's the, if that by chance is their situation, seeing someone else's healing, seeing someone else changed can really be an inspiration for them wanting to reach out for help. Because most likely, the depression is coming from a situation to where they just feel hopeless. Things aren't ever going to change. That's what happened to me. This is the result of that. That's where I'm stuck. But if they can see that healing can happen and change can happen, then that can inspire them to reach out. Thanks, Pamela. Uh, anyone else? Okay. Hi. Um, I want to ask, does taking medication for mental health mean that I'm putting my faith in man? Um, or does God's word say that it's okay? Um, I'd say medication is a is a is a wisdom issue. So it's not a it's not a sin issue. It's not a failure issue. It's is this wise? It it can be a mean of God's a means of God's common grace. So as in any medicine, it's God's common grace to all of man that that we can heal sickness that you can take stuff for your blood pressure. Mm. So it's, not, it's no different to taking something for your blood pressure as to taking something for your, for your brain to work better. So it's not, a, it's not a sin or failure thing, it's a wisdom issue. So is it wise to take medication for your depression? That would be the question, and there are pros and cons on that. So is it wise, is it helpful, what are the side effects? What's the long-term impact? Those are all the questions you'd raise in terms of is it wise? I would say if you are looking to your medication as your savior, then that's not a good reason to take medication. So if you say, well, this, this, it's just this pill. All my hope is in this pill, and this is, this is going to make me better, and I'm, not, and I'm not engaging with the Lord on it. I'm not considering what's going on in my heart. I'm, not, I'm just using the medicine as my savior. Then I'd say that's not a great reason. That, that then wouldn't be a good reason to take medication. But if considering the, the, the benefits and the side effects of it, perhaps it could be a good thing. So I'd say it's a wisdom thing rather than a sin failure thing. I would just say Great that question. not only is it a wisdom thing about whether you will take it, um, true wisdom will lead you to not relying on only that. If you are needing medication for anxiety or depression or any other mental issue, that can be a kind of quick fix. It can mask a problem. It can be a Band-Aid. Um, it can physiologically change your brain to react differently to things, but it's not changing your heart. So 
if medication is wise, take medication, but that's not an excuse to not be talking about the issues that are underlying. So it comes in conjunction with counseling. It comes in conjunction with coming to someone in your church and asking them to walk through this with you. So it's not a counseling or medication. It's if there's an issue that you know is a heart issue, if there's a mental illness perspective to it, consider medication. But don't think that's the answer that you don't need the counseling. It may put you in a space to where you can do more good through the counseling, particularly with anxiety and some other things that you're just so anxious you're not able to deal with the issues. It can get you to a better place to do the hard work that needs to be done in counseling. It's not a it's not a choice either or. So counseling always when there's a heart issue. Medication sometimes if it's wise. Yeah, great question, important question. <laughs> Anything else? Oh. I just want to know what's the best way to help someone who's been through something but pushes you away when you try to be there and they just push you away. That's their coping mechanism, is to push you away. Push people away, generally. <coughs> yeah, it's, it's a little bit like what Sam said earlier. It's, it's just, uh, you know, we can't control other people. Um, but we can love them, we can pray for them. Um, So I guess the question remains, how do we love that person well? So what is the best way that we can love them, mm. that they will allow us? And, and possibly it's just sending them a WhatsApp message. Mm. You know, so actually if, if, they won't, if, if they won't allow me to love them by being present with them, I can pray for them. Mm. And maybe I can send them a WhatsApp me mm. message. I could smile at them. So I get the question is, how can I love them in a way that they will receive? You can drop off a meal, um, send a text, um, as Sam said, but send your text and, and encourage an encouraging Bible verse. Um, maybe come alongside somebody who, who you know that they do trust and, and would maybe is their bestie and, and offer some advice or something through the back door instead of you going towards them. Um, yeah, and, and lots of prayer. Yeah, we just can't, we can't take over their agency. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think that's the, the you know, there's, a, there's mm -hmm. some, it's, these examples remind us of our limits, eh? And we pray, and we love them the best we can, but. Sorry, Carrie, can you say something? How do you overcome trauma of something in the past, in your subconscious? Cannot remember. Sorry, the other question. Trauma in your past that's in your subconscious, but you can't remember it. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. How, how do you overcome it? Trauma that happened in your past, but you it's kind of in your subconscious. Yeah, there's yeah. there's differing differing beliefs on that because um, at a certain point in the history of psychology, it was very, very important to get all the way back to like the moment of your birth and remember everything. Um, and they, they'd used hypnosis, they used a lot of things to try to get back to that point, and they, they were convinced that any kind of a certain thing that was happening in your life today had some abuse that happened in your childhood. Now sometimes we know that's true, but that's not always the case. Um, we can't overcommit to that, so there, there was a, a a period of time for several years where a lot of, for instance, people were wrongly accused of abuses because it was almost a imaginative, hypnotic introduction of something in that person's mind. So we need to be very careful about thinking just because I have these fears, there was something in my childhood. There's a variety of reasons that could be causing those fears. Oftentimes though, and it might be what you're thinking of, is that we have a certain little glimpse of something in our memory. And we know something happened, but we don't have all the details. And we can't put a chronological story together about what happened. But that's very, very common in trauma. 
Um, what we know about the brain during trauma is that it fails to function the way it should. And it doesn't create meaning and truth out of what happened. It's, things are scattered, and we believe wrong things about what happened. So it, it can be helpful to look back on that, and sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's better to say, what are we seeing today? What are we actually wanting to deal with? And let's deal with that. And it may or may not require dealing with something in the past. So it, it just depends on the situation and on the person and, and them just getting wise counsel and how what that should look like. But oftentimes going back is almost creating something in our childhood that might have caused it. But that isn't helping us um, if that wasn't really our experience. So be cautious of, of psychology trying to tell you that everything has some root in your childhood. Um, sometimes it's just things that have happened in our adult lives or our own sinfulness or various things. Um, mental illness, various things. But just don't assume that certain things that sometimes result in this response in our adult life came from a specific event in our childhood. Um, it does take a very discerning, and it's very individual. Every person's experience is different. So I can't answer that without really knowing a lot about what might be suspected, and then what memory is there. So it's, it's complex. Something during the war is likely, a, you might be looking at like a PTSD kind of reaction, um, and they not be aware of what happened, only that this is the way I feel and react because of something that I know happened during that period of time. Is that kind of what mm. this looks like? No? Why don't we talk afterwards? Mm. Yeah, I'd love to talk about it. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Going once. Going twice, okay, <laughs> we'll call it quits there. Um, thank you very much. Um, let's give these guys everyone just a hand of applause. They've done amazing today. <laughs> um, yeah, well that brings us to the end of our program uh, today. Um, yeah, I'm, sh I'm, I'm sure you've been blessed and encouraged by today. Um, so we thank the Lord for that.